Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast. This is our season finale. It's another installment in our Lenin series, and it's a very important episode. Appropriately enough, we are retying the knot of history. We're talking about the Communist International established by Lenin and the founding of a brand new revolutionary Communist International, which will be the first of its kind in living memory with a clean banner. And to help us talk about this important term for our organization and about the inspiring legacy of the Third International, the Common Turn, we have Fred Weston, who is an editor for Marxist.com and a member of the International Secretariat, the leading body of the international Marxist tendency, soon to refound as the revolutionary communist international. Fred, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So Fred's a regular guest. You'll recognize him from episodes about world politics. You were speaking last about the tragic end of Aaron Bushnell. Um, you've spoken to us many times about the crimes of the Israeli regime against the Palestinians. And all of these things actually factor in to the reasons behind the founding of our new revolutionary communist international. And we'll get to all of that. But first of all, let's start with the historical legacy that we're drawing on. Can we talk about the uh, previous two internationals, the first international established by Marx, Engels and others, and the second international. What were those organizations like and what happened to them? Well, the first international, uh, the International Working Men's Association, which both Marx and Engels played an important part in building, um, was, was quite different uh, in terms of the fact that it had within it different trends, different mm -hmm. tendencies. Marx and Engels worked with uh, different types of people. And in effect, they spent several years uh, working that organization up towards being a genuine Marxist international. Um, <clears throat> through experience and through their interventions and drafting uh, statements and making speeches, etc., they gradually um, won that international organization to Marxism, revolutionary Marxism. Um, but uh, in, I don't want to go into the details of it, obviously, but um, in the aftermath of the defeat of the Paris Commune, which had a huge impact on the left, on the, the labor movement across Europe, it had a demoralizing effect, in fact, because it was a massive defeat of the first real genuine revolutionary movement of the working class in which they actually took power for a period to see that smashed and drowned in blood had a very negative effect and it had um, a negative effect also on the environment around the left and the first thing Marx and Engels did was to propose shifting the center from London to New York in the hope of moving it to a healthier environment not one made up of demoralized exiles but in the end, um, the organization was dissolved. Uh, internal uh, fighting, the conflict with the anarchists. I think Marx and Engels saw very far ahead and realized it was better to close down that international and leave a clean banner of genuine Marxism rather than allow it to actually degenerate either into an opportunist reformist outfit or an ultra-left sectarian outfit. Um, and then they proceeded to work nonetheless without an international organization, um, concentrating on giving advice to the individual leaderships of the, the various socialist and socialist parties. In particular, they worked with the German Marxists and basically created the forces in several countries to refound a new international. By then, Marx, uh, was, uh, was, uh, was dead, but Engels saw um, the birth of the Second International, and he worked closely with a lot, a lot of its leaders, which, formally speaking, started out, not like the first, but started out uh, clearly uh, Marxist in its in internal um, thinking, in its ideology, in its policy, in its perspectives and methods, um, fighting from, for, for Marxist ideas. Uh, I could add, though, that from the very beginning, there were certain opportunist trends within it, um, which later on would become significant. Um, it's, not, it's not a place here to go into the details of that, 
But over a long period of, particularly in Germany, you see that there was a period of growth of the economy and these these organizations adapted to the um, growing capitalist system and gradually, in effect, separated the revolutionary ideas from the reformist. And that then leads us to the dramatic events at the beginning of World War I, um, which is when uh, the leaders of the Second International openly betrayed the working class. Um, in the Congresses of the Second International, I'm going on memory, I think 1907 and 1912, there were resolutions which clearly stated that if the um, the bourgeoisie of the national, you know, of each country um, were to launch a war uh, where workers of, all, of different countries would be sent to kill each other, um, the role of the socialist parties and the social democracy would be to transform the war between nations into a war between classes. And we should say that the Second International was a mass organization, particularly yes. strong in Germany, had millions of members. It had the capacity to practice what it preached in that regard. If it wanted to, it could have had turned they wanted to, they the could war have, into a civil yeah. war. It would, have, it would have meant going against a very strong current of public opinion that the bourgeoisie was creating. But if they'd started from the very beginning by highlighting the class questions... Um, they could have moved in that direction. Instead, they all voted for the war credits. I think you can see some parallels today with the attitude of the reformist left, nearly the entire political left, actually, towards the war in Ukraine, where you had group after group, party after party, lining up behind their respective bourgeois, their respective capitalists, their respective imperialists, rather yes. than taking an internationalist position. That's right. Instead of explaining... Uh, what was behind the war, um, they've all sided with their own uh, ruling classes. Yeah. Not just on the Ukraine, but also, if you look at it, on Gaza. Yes. Uh, they are backing um, Israel in yeah. the war. Or at in best, they have a kind of impotent pacifist position, which was also a factor in the First World War. Yes, it means that you actually have no position, um, no real position that can intervene in, in, um, in the situation. So... Um, August the 4th, 1914, a day that lives in infamy in mm -hmm. the history of the workers' movement where the leaders of the Second International voted for war credits, lined up behind their imperialists and sent the workers of Europe to slaughter each other in the trenches. I believe that when Lenin first received news of this betrayal, he refused to believe it was true. That's true. I mean, Lenin... I mean, obviously, Lenin could see in Russia the Mensheviks, who were part of the uh, Social Democratic Party, um, could see their opportunism, and he could see so there, were, there, there were clearly um, opportunist currents within uh, the Second International, but he couldn't, he hadn't reached the conclusion that, uh, how, how, of how far the degeneration had gone, and how far these people were prepared to go in the betrayal of the working class, and couldn't imagine that they would openly go against the resolutions they'd all voted for just a few years earlier. Mm. So he actually believed, I mean, it didn't take long for him to find out the truth, but the first impression was this can't be true. But then, it, of course, it was true. And then the, 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 the question was posed, where do genuine revolutionary Marxists go from here? And this is what began the process which would eventually lead to the founding of the Third International. It starts with, well, in the beginning, very, very isolated, in exile, uh, the war going on. But in the midst of this, they, 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 uh, they struggled to bring together the anti-war elements within the Second International. In 1915, 1916, you have the, 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 the meetings of the left, the famous gathering of, the, of Zimmerwald, which even then, the Zimmerwald, the Zimmerwald uh, conference was a small gathering. I think Lenin said you could gather the true internationalists in, in two stagecoaches. Mm -hmm. So small was it. It wasn't far from the truth. Yes. And but but the point is even even within that layer, there were the openly revolutionary wing, but you also had elements who were not prepared to break with the right wing. So they were compromising. 
but it was the beginning. It was the beginning of a gathering of the um, of the of the of the revolutionary left, and within it you had the Zimmerwald left, obviously, which was Lenin was at the heart of that, and it's around these figures that once the Ru Russian Revolution breaks out and is successful in taking power, and what produced the first revolution also produced waves of revolution in several other countries. Italy, 1917, you had mass protests, hundreds of people killed on the streets, uh, protesting for the lack of bread, for example, in Turin. Um, in 1918, you have the German revolution. Mm. In 1919, you have the Hungarian revolution. You see how quickly a situation of extreme yes. reaction and national chauvinism... It swings completely the other way. The working class were, were marching um, proudly to war. Only a few years prior, there was general public approval, as you say, for the imperialist war. Um, the genuine internationalists, the anti-war left, were swimming against the stream, but within a few years, the situation has done a 180-degree turn. Yes, it changes radically because, one, the experience of the war, yes. the terrible butchery, um, the soldiers returning from the front, obviously expecting to find something better than hyperinflation, unemployment, unemployment and poverty, mm. which is what they faced. And this produced a wave of revolution. As I said, Hungary 1919 was followed by Italy 1920, the occupation of the factories. Similar revolutionary developments in France in 1920. Um, if you look at the, the growth of the workers' organizations, I mean, literally we're talking about millions and millions of workers. Germany, Italy, France. You look at the figures of Britain, massive increase in the trade union membership. A huge wave of strikes, factory occupations, etc., and also uh, a massive influx into the political organizations of the working class. In this period, you see the German Social Democracy, the Italian Socialist Party, the French, the Labour Party, the British trade unions, all of them massively growing. What does it mean? It means that Within that mass of millions and millions of workers joining the unions, there was also a very big layer that was going beyond the trade union question and looking for a political answer. Mm -hmm. And they joined what they had always perceived to be the traditional left, the traditional mass socialist parties yeah. of the working class. And this is a feature you see across the history of the workers' movement. The masses, as their first port of call, will always move through, or tend to move through, the organisations that are familiar to them. Yes, then it was particularly strong, this mm -hmm. uh, this this uh, phenomenon. Um, just on memory, uh, I think the German unions went to like 5 million. Mm -hmm. In Italy, the Socialist Party went from 60,000 in 1918 to 210,000 in 1920. Mm -hmm. It's three times the size it was. What did that mean? It meant that these parties were now full of recently radicalized workers, young workers mainly, looking for an answer to the crisis in the system. But they came up against a little problem, which was what we referred to earlier on. The opportunist trends uh, within the Second International had produced a leadership which was not prepared to lead a revolution, wasn't even prepared to recognize a revolution was being prepared or even taking place. Um, they all turned against the Bolsheviks and the Russian Revolution, calling it basically uh, madness on the part of the Bolsheviks. Blakhanov was a clear example of this. Their position was... Um, Capitalism had not exhausted all its potential. Uh, what Marxists had to do was bide their time, be the left within the bourgeois system, where the bourgeoisie hadn't yet completed its revolution, support the bourgeoisie in the so-called bourgeois revolution, supporting the progressive bourgeoisie. And because of this, they actually played a reactionary role in holding back the working class. They did this repeatedly, mm and led, for instance, to the defeat of the 1918 revolution in Germany. In Italy, in 1920, Italy was on the verge of a revolution. It was the leadership of the Socialist Party that maneuvered to pull the class back from the brink of revolution. And this happened repeatedly. It became very evident that the Second International was, in effect, 
from the point of view of, um, let's say, the revolutionary overthrow of capitalism, the Second International was dead. And it actually signed its own death uh, certificate back in August 1914. What's the point of an international workers' organization that does not campaign against um, the butchery that forced workers of France to kill workers of Germany, to kill workers of Russia, um, etc. It was in this context that you started to see actually the development of the left wing within many of these parties. Um, and a parallel in a certain sense to the split between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks in Russia, which had crystallized into two separate organizations prior to the First World War, this was now repeated on an international scale. You had the revolutionary wing of the Italian Socialist Party. You had the revolutionary wing of the French um, Socialist Party. You had the, um, Spartacist, uh, uh, the Spartacists in Germany. Then you had the split in the social democracy, the USPD, which splits from the social democracy, almost a 50-50 split down the middle with the left breaking away from uh, from the right this was happening around the world um, where where you had mass social democratic and socialist parties it was in this context that lenin already in the first world war posed the question we need a new international mm -hmm. we need a new international with a clean banner mm -hmm. not with a dirty shirt of the old social democracy he even he even uh, fought in in russia uh, to change the name of the party, which was, you know, the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party B, you know, Bolshevik as opposed to the Menshevik. But he actually at one point says, we should come out clearly with what we are. We are communists. To go back, in effect, to the name that Marx gave the organization, the manifesto, after all, is not the manifesto of the social democracy. It's the manifesto of the Communist Party. Openly declare what we, what, what they were, communists. Social democracy was a name which was imposed partially by the conditions they worked in. They had to, in effect, because of the uh, the anti you know the anti socialist laws, the anti trade union laws, the repressive laws of the of different capitalist countries, calling themselves social democrats, um, when in reality they were Marxists and communists. The time had come by 1917 to state that clearly, not just in Russia but on an international scale. Mm -hmm. And so there begins the work of creating the new international. Now we could go into here, what I'd like to outline is how those parties were created. They came into existence in, in different ways. Um, there was one trend, which was basically what I said before, this massive influx of young radicalized revolutionary workers joining a mass a, a, a socialist party in conditions of revolution coming up against the obstacle of the, the the old social democratic bureaucracy the right wing the opportunists and a conflict emerged within these parties this was clear in germany it was clear in italy it was clear in france and if you look at the way it happened in france in 1920 they held a conference i think it was around about the spring of 1920 and the question of should we join the Third International was posed because it had been founded in 1919. Um, and they decided to send a delegation to Russia to visit, to discuss, to see, and report back. There was a huge uh, surge towards the Communist International inside the French Socialist Party. They reconvened. Uh, this is curious. They actually started their Congress on Christmas Day, 1920 very keen these guys um, and they had a debate in which the delegation reported back uh, the right wing fought the idea of adhering to the common turn the left wing fought for it and in the end by a big majority the delegates voted to join the common turn to join the communist international and to change the name of the party to the um, the communist party of france the french communist party um, the right wing split away. They refused to adhere to that, and they basically reformed the old Socialist Party with the uh, with the right wing rump. But the majority uh, joined 
um, the International and declared the Communist Party. In effect, within the active, more conscious layer of the working class organized in the Socialist Party, the majority were won over to the ideas of Lenin and the Bolsheviks and formed the French Communist Party. So this is a classic example of the formation of a revolutionary party from within the old organization. Something similar happened in Italy. Um, in 1920, you had the occupation of the factories, openly betrayed by the Socialist Party leaders. Mm. In January 1921, you have the convening of the Congress of the Socialist Party. Um, curiously enough, a little thing to note, the Socialist Party of Italy, the PSI, had adhered to the Comintern. Mm. People don't know that the symbol of the old Socialist Party by then included the hammer and sickle on its, uh, on its banner. Uh, but the problem was, and this is something that Lenin dealt with in a later Congress when he, he, he elaborated the 21 points, i.e. the 21 conditions. Now, the reason those conditions were elaborated by Lenin is, is exactly what, what we saw in Italy, i.e. the whole party joined the Comintern, but with all of its components, even the right-wing opportunists, yeah, the brings Turatis, the, It brings the baggage along with it. Yeah. So the, po the, po the problem was posed... We have to break with these people. Right. And these people have got to be removed from these parties. Now, that became uh, an urgent question inside the Socialist Party by 19, January 1921, because although they were officially adhering to the Comintern, the leadership of the Socialist Party betrayed the mass movement of the working class in Italy between 1918 and 1920, and a clarification was absolutely necessary. Mm. At the Congress in January... 1921, the left wing, the, the revolutionary left, let's say, of the, so, of the Socialist Party, around Bordiga, who was the main leader, and Gramsci in Turin, and a few other important figures, they split. They broke, they walked out of the Congress, actually moved just a few yards down the road to a famous theatre in Livorno, and convened the first Congress of the Italian Communist Party. Mm. And they became the official... Italian section, with about one third of the members of the Socialist Party in um, in in Italy. So both France and Italy, Germany, not quite exactly the same, but through a process which saw the mass split of the independent social democracy, which again later on in the fusion with the Spartacists at a certain point who had left and came back, in that process the German Communist Party emerged. The more opportunist trends within the independent social democrats did not adhere. They drifted back towards the social democracy eventually. But you, you, you see the crystallization of a mass communist party in Germany. So in one way or another, the Italian example, the French example, the German example, are classical examples of a revolutionary party emerging from the radicalization of the old workers' party, with a strong left wing developing within it. And because you had this powerful focal point of the Russian Revolution and the Bolshevik Party and the Comintern, they um, proceeded to build mass communist parties. But it wasn't the only way that communist parties emerged. I'd like to give the Chinese example, sure. if I could. Yeah, of course. You see, in China, there was no social democracy, no socialist party. Mm -hmm. There was no workers' organization as such. Um, the communists in China in 1921 gather... Um, to found the Chinese Communist Party. Now, there's a bit of debate sometimes about when can you call yourself a party? How big do you have to be? Yeah. I think that's a bit of a... A bit mechanical. A bit mechanical, a bit, a bit abstract in the sense that you need to look at the reality on the ground. I don't think anybody, anybody today who considers themselves a, a Marxist or a communist would question the fact that the Chinese communists in 1921 called themselves a party. But it's interesting to note how many members that party had. It had exactly 59 members. They had a congress, I think, of 12 delegates, and they launched the party. So pretty modest then. I think, yes. <laughs> um, now, it took them some time to build up the first thousand, but they didn't emerge as a left wing of anything. Um, they were a party built from zero. There, were, there was no other workers' party, for instance, the tactical question of the United Front in terms of, um, you know, the social democracy, etc., which is something else we could discuss, which was a, a key question discussed in the Comintern Congresses. 
in China, they just built the Communist Party, built up the forces, and then by 1926, when the revolution erupted, I think they had about a thousand members and they became 60,000 very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. That's how the Chinese Communist Party was built. And then we have another example, which is the British one. Yeah, because that was founded from a merger of small socialist and Marxist organizations. You had the Communist Unity Group, the South Wales Socialist Society, the British Socialist Party. It was yes. a ragtag gang of sects, basically. It was a, it was, it was a fusion of different groups, mm -hmm. which also was reflected in their early days in different positions. Some of them were much more sectarian than others. Mm -hmm. Now... In Britain, it was the fusion of a few groups, and they were able to build a party of something like 5,000 members. Mm -hmm. Again, they called themselves the party, even though that they were a, a relatively small organization. But what I'd like to underline here is I've described three different ways in which the communist parties emerged. Internal contradictions in the old organizations, a completely new party in um, China, or a bringing together of older, smaller groups on the left in Britain. In one way or another, through these different routes, the different communist parties were created, and they adhered and joined the Communist International. Now, what we have with the Comintern in its early days is one party, the Bolshevik Party, the Russian Communist Party now, with a lot of experience, with a tested leadership under Lenin and Trotsky, who later joined, um, who had learnt and drawn the lessons of the previous years of building their party. And for example, this key question of the tactic of the United Front. This was an, um, <clears throat> in 1920, in the Congress in 1920, Lenin realised he had a, a huge task on his hands, i.e., to educate these young, fresh forces, not just the ranks, but even the leadership, in <clears throat> tactical questions. Lenin understood, for instance, in Italy, in France, in Germany, they had, in effect, won over the advance layers of the working class. It's not enough to win over the advance layers to carry out a revolution. You can win over the advance layers and organize them as a separate revolutionary communist party, but unless you win the masses, you will never carry out a revolution. Mm -hmm. And Lenin emphasized the need for the tactic of the united front. Now, this is something that, for instance, the leadership of the Italian Communist Party under Bordiga did not understand and never understood, actually. Mm -hmm. um, in France, there were elements of this. In Germany, in Holland, in several in, in Britain, they, they were divided over this question. What is the United Front tactic? Fundamentally, Lenin explains, in order to win over the masses, it's not enough simply to, to declare yourself, well, we're the revolutionary communists, join us. No, you've got to prove in practice and actually working with the mass of the working class. And when you have a significant layer of the working class, which is looking to, for instance, the leadership of the old Italian Socialist Party, or the German social democracy, or in the case of France, they look to the right wing split away from the um, 1920 Congress, or in Britain where you had this massive dominating Labour Party, Lenin explained the tactics the Bolsheviks used towards the Mensheviks. You know, when the Mensheviks were uh, participating in the provisional government um, in an opportunist manner, the slogans of the Bolsheviks were you know, at that, down with the 10, uh, you know, bourgeois ministers, um, basically saying, break with the bourgeois. And when he raised the slogan, all power to the Soviets, the Soviets were in the hands of the Mensheviks and the social revolutionists. He was saying to them, you have the majority, take the power. And also, for instance, in Italy, how would you apply the United Front tactic? The Communist Party should have offered openly an alliance to the Socialist Party, on the basis of the anti-fascist struggle, to say to the Socialist Party workers, okay, you don't, you don't agree with us revolutionary communists, but we all have a common interest in fighting fascism. Let's fight together. Now, obviously, if the Socialist Party leaders had refused that, that would have given the lever to the leaders of the Communist Party to talk to the ranks and say, look, we want to fight with you and your leaders against fascism. They refuse. 
The Italian Communist Party leaders never understood this to the point where they actually withdrew their for- forces from the Arditi del Popolo, which was a spontaneous movement, particularly of young workers all over Italy, from different parties wanting to fight fascism. Lenin wrote left-wing communism specifically on this question. Not only did he write it, he, he, he took great care in editing it, making sure it was printed, and copies were ready for every delegate that attended the 1920 Congress. In Britain, he went even further than the question of the United Front. He, Because of the, uh, the, the, the relationship between the, Brit- the Communist Party in Britain and the Labour Party was so much more in favour of Labour in, in, in terms of size and influence, that he actually suggested as a tactic that they seek to affiliate to the Labour Party and work within it. Um, this is the same Lenin that, um, you know, led the revolution in 1917. But he understood that the, 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 let's say, the consciousness of the British working class had not yet reached the level of that of the Russia in 1917. They needed time, experience, and an intelligent tactic on the part of the communists to reach revolutionary conclusions. Again, that debate had, I know, there's a conflict over, over these questions. Um, but you see, the, 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 the different parties came into being, as I said, in the different ways. Now, the reason I'm stressing that is this. How are mass revolutionary communist parties going to come into existence in the future? I think we should not have a rigid mechanical approach and say, I don't know, it will be just like the French party in 1920. One day, I don't know, the, the radicalization of the Labour Party will reach a position where the majority will vote to become revolutionary communists. That would be an extremely, um, how do you say, abstract and mechanical way of looking at things. The likelihood of that happening tomorrow with Starmer, um, I think it answers itself, that, 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 that point. However, that does not, it doesn't mean that that kind of scenario could not appear in this or that country on the basis of the class struggle and radicalization. Um, you could have the emergence of smaller um, revolutionary communist parties. For instance, in Italy in the 1970s, the ultra-left groups, I remember I was there in the 70s, were able to mobilize 100,000 youth on a demonstration in Bologna. Some of them had 10, 20,000 members each. I lived through that, and I remember thinking, if instead of being split up into all these different ultra-left groups, this force of 100,000 was organized under a a genuine Marxist leadership, that would have been the makings of a revolutionary party to the left of the Communist Party. If such a party had existed and had applied a correct tactic, i.e. the united front of Lenin, towards the then mass Italian Communist Party, history may have been very different today. It's a, it's a lesson um, to be um, to be learnt. We need to be flexible in our approach. We need to be flexible also in the understanding of how the perspectives can pan out. Um, that um, is an important question. Um, just to bring to an end this point about the actual Comintern, um, the, the question of the United Front was one of the key debates in the Comintern, i.e. it was Lenin and Trotsky struggling to educate the parties yes. and to combat the sectarianism, which sometimes it's, you know, it's a healthy sectarianism against the opportunists and the right wing, but it's not enough uh, uh, to have that healthy rejection of those people. You've also got to discuss how we're now going to win the mass of workers who follow those people. Mm, well, the slogan of the Third Congress was to the masses. That's right. So this question of finding a bridge That's right. to the mass of this workers was, was this central was a, in the minds of mm, Lenin and Trotsky. This was a, a thread throughout the whole of those congresses, in effect. But there was also discussions about the trade unions. Mm-hmm. Should communists work in bureaucratic trade unions, in the, you know treacherous, betraying trade unions, and... Lenin insisted that, yes, we do. Well, the Bolsheviks worked yeah. in trade unions set up by the Tsar. That's right. Um, you would work in any... The police agents that were right. running them. Y- you would work in these organizations and to try and connect with the mass of workers in them. Yeah. Um, other debates were on things like the national question, the right of self-determination, um, the colonial question. For example, the it was the Comintern really that developed a genuine revolutionary policy on, on the colonial question because... 
if you go back to the second international, some of their leaders mm. actually considered that because, because pra- capitalism in their view was going through its progressive period, colonizing meant exporting progress mm. and um, developing these countries. So they saw, I don't know, Britain colonizing Africa and India is a progressive it's, step. It's the white man's burden given a lick of red paint by yes, the sounds of it. it was, it was the, abs- uh, the absurd degree they'd gone to in their degeneration. The Comintern had a genuine revolutionary approach to this question and quite, and also discussed the tactical questions. What should the communists do in the colonial revolution? What approach to have to the local bourgeoisie in the struggle against imperialism? These are all debates which, which they had. And I would say this to conclude on that particular period is that we today claim the first four congresses of the Communist International. That's from 1919 to 1922. Yes, that period. We claim the theses, the conclusions, and the discussions and the documents that emerged from those congresses as ours. It's part of our heritage. We base ourselves on, um, on that. Now, it's not the place here to go into the details of the degeneration of the Communist International and the degeneration of the Russian Revolution. We have plenty plenty of material on why that happened. But you'll notice that after those congresses, and think about it, in the middle of the Civil War, the Bolsheviks held annual international congresses. Lenin and Trotsky, Trotsky came away from the front to participate in the congresses. They gave enormous importance to the international because they understood the salvation of the Russian Revolution the building of communism, genuine communism in Russia would only be possible with a successful international revolution. Lenin dedicated a lot of attention to the German revolution. He thought it was key to the, to the whole European revolution. Now, without going into the details, obviously, one revolution after another, for different reasons, initially the betrayal of the social democracy, later in some cases, the actual immaturity and the infantilism uh, of the leadership of the communist parties, Mm -hmm. in one way or another, the revolutionary wave was defeated, capitalism managed to survive, it stabilized itself. This led to the isolation of the Russian Revolution and prepared the material conditions for the bureaucratic degeneration. And notice, no longer annual congresses of the communist international. In fact, I think... Was it the seventh? Was the last one in th- in the mid thirties, um, and they were no longer genuine congresses of genuine debate with different tendencies. It wasn't tolerated. It was the line passed down by the bureaucracy, the interests of the bureaucracy in the Soviet Union. And it was Zinoviev who started that before Stalin got his hands on it, of course. Yes, uh, it, he played a role actually in in facilitating this with the Zinovievite methods. But, um, and then finally in 1943, Stalin just signs away the, the dissolution of the international. Yeah. Didn't even call a congress, didn't even consult the, the individual member, uh, parties, um, on what they thought. They just dissolved it because they were in alliance with the imperialists. The yeah, Second it was a World sop War. to the imperialists. Yeah. I've, got, I've got a quick quote actually from an article written at the time by Ted Grant. In 1943, the rise and fall of the Communist International, which I'll link in the description of this episode because it's an excellent article. And the opening paragraph uh, reads as follows. The Third International has been officially buried in the most undignified and contemptible fashion it would be possible to conceive. It has passed off the stage of history, hurriedly and without consultation of all the adhering parties, not to speak of the rank and file throughout the world, without any democratic discussion and decision as a result of the pressure of American imperialism, Stalin has perfidiously abandoned the Comintern. That's right. That's right. He had no, he had no use for it by, by then. Uh, And in the meantime, the communist parties in most countries had begun to drift towards national parties, um, not parties that belong to one international. And, uh, eventually, you end up with, say, the Italian Communist Party with its two million members in the 70s, which was, uh, if you looked at its policy and its ideas, it was indistinguishable from the leaders of the British Labour Party. In fact, I actually remember in the 70s, a leader of the Italian Communist Party coming to Britain, 
his name was Napolitano, who later became the president of the Italian Republic, um, a man of the Italian state, came to speak, and there were left-wing members of the Labour Party, and they said to me, is that a communist? Is he a communist? And I said, yep, that is your Italian Communist Party leadership. <laughs> they had completely abandoned revolutionary Marxism and had adopted a, a reformist outlook. Um, I mean, that's a separate discussion, but it does, um, it does touch on the question of why we are calling ourselves revolutionary communists and not simply communists. We are communists, but there is a problem that, for instance, in Italy, uh, the communist identity has two sides to it. One is the revolutionary traditions of the Italian working class under fascism after the war, etc. The other was the reformist degeneration of the Communist Party leaders. Mm. And uh, therefore, we think to, to, to make it absolutely clear where we stand, we're calling ourselves revolutionary communists. And the um, in Britain, we are going to launch the Revolutionary Communist Party, the same in in um, Canada and America, they're going to call themselves the Revolutionary Communists of America. In other countries where maybe the the, 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 the organization is a little bit smaller, communists are preferred to call themselves the, the um, International Communist Organization. Or Revolutionary Communist Organization. Yeah, di different, different ways of presenting more or less the same identity, i.e. it's a communist, it's internationalist, it's revolutionary, and it's something you can join and apply to join. Mm -hmm. Now, why... Have we adopted this? We, we've published a manifesto, the manifesto of the Revolutionary Communist International. Which I will link also in the episode description. Which, which is basically a, an outline of our basic analysis of the crisis of capitalist society that we're facing, the impasse that we're facing, the period that we're in. We've entered. It's early days. We should not never exaggerate these things. But it's the early days of a completely new situation, mm -hmm. um, which is pregnant with class struggle on an immense scale. We've had tastes of this in one country after another, anticipations of it. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen it in, um, in the strike waves in France uh, the other year. Um, we've seen it in um, Sri Lanka with the huge movement there that saw the collapse of the, re of, uh, of the regime. Um, we've seen mass strikes, huge movements, but I would just like to outline briefly how we see, let's, let's, let's call it the development of consciousness in a certain sense. Um, 2008 crisis was a turning point, but very often what we understand as an objective turning point doesn't immediately lead to an object, a, a turning point in, um, let's say, consciousness mm -hmm. or a subjective or an understanding. An understanding of the objective reality right. can take time. Right. You could have a, a major crisis of capitalism, huge attacks on workers' living standards and wages and living conditions, but it doesn't necessarily mean that instantaneously that's followed by a wave of radical action and an understanding of the needs right. to transform society. There can be a delay. Look, in reality, human consciousness tends to lag behind. Mm -hmm. It tends to have a conservative element to it. It takes time to break and with the past and to understand the new situation. And there's a tendency, like after 2008, first of all, to think that there's somehow it's possible to find some kind of policy or that can take us back to the good old days, mm. to the days when wages were better, when the healthcare system was better, when education was better, when life was better. There's a tendency always to look back. How can we get back to what we had? It takes experience and understanding to draw the conclusion that, just a minute, no, no, no. There's no way of going back to that on the basis of capitalism. In fact, we've entered a serious crisis. That takes time to, 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 to feed through. So with a bit of a delay, we saw the first effects, which were, we saw things like Corbyn mm -hmm. in Britain, uh, Sanders in the United States, Syriza in Greece, mm -hmm. Podemos in Spain, Mélenchon in France. In one way or another, we saw what we would define as a kind of, I suppose you define them as a left reformist social democracy emerging, 
Um, Corbyn was probably the, the clearest expression of that. Mélenchon also has had moments um, like that. Syriza was actually a split from the old Communist Party of Greece. Paradoxically, it was actually the opportunist right wing split, the Eurocommunists. Podemos was like almost from nowhere, a new formation. But in one, Sanders, who never actually broke with the Democrats, but for a period, he spoke about, you know, the, the revolution against the billionaire class yeah. and, uh, and the, um, the mass rallies of 100,000, 150,000. The DNC establishments fought an internal battle against him and his supporters. Obviously, he eventually capitulated and now just reliably tailgates That's whatever exactly. the DNC tells him to do. But there was a period in which Corbyn, Sanders, Syriza, Podemos, Mélenchon and, and, and others around the world, you saw the emergence of a significant trend within the working class around these figures. It would not be an exa- exa- exaggeration to say that in Britain, hundreds of thousands joined the Labour Party to support Corbyn. Mm. Um, Syriza, which started off as a, a party of 4% in the elections, always described as the far left by the media, which it never was, but that's how it was presented. And when they tell us that the far left could never become a mass force, well, they told the workers of Greece that Syriza was the far left. Well, they decided that they wanted them in government. And they massively started to vote for Syriza. And it's, it went from 4%. Within a short period, it was 36% and um, formed the government of uh, Greece. Podemos started around a few celebrities and personalities and became a mass force. But the characteristics of all of these, all of them slightly different from each other, in the end was this. They all believed that they could somehow tinker with the capitalist system, somehow, I don't know, defend the NHS, provide good education and tax jobs. Tax the rich. Yeah, tax the rich. And this, this idea they have that austerity is, um, it's an ideological thing. It's, it's basically, if you want to simplify it, it's nasty, horrible Tories doing it because they want to be nasty. Mm. They don't have to be. They could apply a different policy within capitalism i.e. without changing fundamentally the system you can actually achieve reforms right well that just isn't possible but the hundreds of thousands who supported them they didn't think oh this is impossible to do they believed in corbyn they believed if we get a corbyn government if corbyn can can um, can form a government then we can stop all this um but we see what happened to all of them in one way or another they succumbed. Sanders, after having raised the hopes of many, capitulated to the um, uh, to the Democrats. Uh, Corbyn, faced with a, a huge onslaught from the right wing, instead of organizing the hundreds of thousands of supporters around him to really take control of the Labour Party, which was within his grasp, as soon as he was accused of anti-Semitism, which was completely false, he started apologizing and feared the consequences of splitting the Labour Party, basically, he allowed the right wing to take control. And they didn't have any qualms about splitting Labour. They started expelling left, right and centre, and le- and, which led then to the exit of hundreds of thousands from the Labour Party. Syriza. Syriza has massively uh, declined in its support, mm. um, electoral support, etc. Well, Syria so, was, almo- was almost worse in the eyes of working people because it did actually have power. They governed. It, act- it was the one carrying out yeah. the attacks. They carried out a referendum, got that far. raising the hopes that it would a- they would actually stand up to the European Union. Mm-hmm. And after the people actually did vote, no, mm-hmm. we're not going to accept the austerity, they proceeded to accept it mm-hmm. and destroyed it. That was a period of a radicalization to the left around these figures, and then a, dis- a massive disappointment and disillusionment. And it's a perfect storm because that period was followed immediately by the COVID pandemic, which was followed, I mean, the pandemic is still going on actually, but the intense period of the pandemic was followed by the cost of living crisis Inflation. and the war in Ukraine. Yes. And now the war in Gaza, which every bourgeois imperialist governments around the world is 
insuring continues and gets worse and worse. That's right. Still sending arms and money to Israel. So you've got a combination of a, a deep and abiding crisis of capitalism, which has been ongoing really for over a decade now. Yeah. Um, and throw on top of that these left reformist tendencies and trends and figures who've all been tested and discarded, in large part discarded. And you have this new intensification of the crisis, these horrible crimes of capitalism on the world stage. You could even, we haven't even mentioned climate change, of course, this of course. existential threat that is um, posing a genuine question mark over the future of human civilization. You put all that together, and it's not surprising that there's a renewed interest in and enthusiasm for the banner and ideas of communism. Yes. And it's all those things that crystallized, first of all, in the Alive a Communist campaign, which we ran for just over a year now and produced great results that we've mentioned a number of times in the podcast. And you can read about it on our website, marxist.com. But why this particular turn now? Why is the founding of this new international, this new revolutionary communist international, we think the most appropriate response to these conditions? Well, you see, um, history uh, puts the test all trends and currents. And history is not wasted. Historical events are not wasted. The Corbyn experience, although very disappointing for the people who adhered to it, the same with those who had illusions in Sanders, that was that was actually a necessary phase in the how do you say it? the the clarification of ideas, the understanding of millions of young workers. It was a school, you could say. It's a school, school of reformism. It was an experience combined with the deepening of the crisis of capitalism. You said climate change. That's something that really um, grips the minds of millions of young people in, in particular. But the wars that are going on, um, you know, today I, I was reading uh, some of them are actually considering provoking a conflict with Hezbollah openly, i.e. widening this conflict. Israel bombing uh, targets in Syria, brazenly uh, just bombing another country, trying to heighten tensions rather than calm things down. Young people are looking at a world which is tobogganing towards a disaster, climate change, but also economically, inflation, which has hit people, um, living conditions, the consequences of flooding, drought, etc., etc., the healthcare system, the education system. This system is rotting on its feet. Mm -hmm. Now, this has, has produced... It's not a mass form. It's not, it's not like the whole of the working class has moved towards communist ideas. That would be um, not a, a realistic appraisal of the situation. But there's a significant layer that has. They have drawn the conclusion, the socialists, the social democrats, they're not serious. Mm -hmm. And what we found is there's a significant layer of young people. We live in the epoch of the internet, of course. Mm -hmm. They're looking around. And the Marxist ideas are available. Lenin's texts, his ideas, his, his, his writings are there. Um, young people looking to, there must be another way. Yeah. And that other way, obviously, bourgeois politics, capitalist politics is, is not the way. The reformist approach has, uh, is seen to have failed. And they're looking for a revolutionary way out. Mm -hmm. And they're openly identifying as communists. Now, in the building of the future mass revolutionary communist parties, we, we've got to start somewhere. Uh, and we can't start with the masses. We have to start with the most advanced layers. Now, there is that layer that's not attracted to the Corbyns today or the Sanders in any way. They're looking for a revolutionary alternative. It's not there. There isn't, there isn't a mass revolutionary alternative for, the, for them to... Um, gather around we looked at the situation we we, we, ran, we we got all this information about this huge percentage especially of the younger generation seeing communism as the best form the, the ideal way of running society i.e. drawing the conclusion that the system is so sick 
it needs to be revolutionary. It, there's, there needs to be a revolutionary way out and a communist way out. Last year, we launched the Are You a Communist campaign, Get Organized, and it was hugely successful. What it meant was we were actually connecting with this mass of, in effect, atomized individual young workers and young students um, who see themselves as communists, want an end to this system, are absolutely sick of it, can't see a way out, see a total impasse, they actually see a disaster coming unless something is done. They want to do something about it, but they're not going to join the left, the so-called, well, the non-existent left of the Labour Party yeah. or, um, or or any of the, these other formations. And in most cases, they're not going to be looking towards the old communist parties either. I mean, the, no, it, the some, some of them, some of them, I've seen people who go there because they're simply called communists. Yeah, they have the name. In, the, and the, and in America, discover, for example, yeah. the American Communist Party, the CPUSA, gains several thousand members right. in a short space of time because it had the name, but, but what I think it what failed to hold there? on to those, yeah. So what happens there is you adhere to an organization which formerly is still called the Communist Party, but its content is completely reformist. Right. And once you're in, you go, you realize that. So they're looking for something genuinely revolutionary and communist. And that's why we took the decision that based on the experience of um, all this experience, analyzing the situation, um, and the practical experience we've had over the last year is that there's this layer of, uh, let's call it openly communist uh, youth and workers, is a significant layer. It's a minority, obviously, but it's a significant layer. And what is our task as revolutionary communists? It's not to sit and wait for, the, um, for Corbyn one day to wake up and realize what he's got to do, which I don't know if it will ever happen. But to go directly to the youth who identify with revolutionary communism and create a, pole, a, po a point of reference, a, an organization they can join. Therefore, it's our duty to make ourselves as identifiable as possible to uh, um, an organization which is easier to find in its name, in its banner, in the way it works, in the way it intervenes in the movement and attract them and organize them as a force. We need to organize this layer into not just a mass of individuals. They need to be brought together as a force, as a party, uh, around a common program, a revolutionary program for the overthrow of capitalism, for the socialist transformation of society. Um, and the Revolutionary Communist International is an international organization that brings together the various national um, uh, formations um, and we want to raise our banner as high as possible make it as visible as possible because we want all these young people these workers who have drawn these conclusions who are looking for an organization with which to fight to join us and help us build that party which the working class deserves and in much the same way that the Communist International was a school for the revolutionary working class, it was a cauldron of ideas. The founding conference of the Revolutionary Communist International, which will take place in your homeland, Fred, in Italy, um, between the 10th and 15th of June, will be a school of our ideas. It's going to have over 20 sessions covering all aspects of our program, talking about philosophy, talking about the national question, talking about um, the building of the Bolshevik Party, talking about the struggle against oppression and bigotry. It's going to be a major turning point, not just for our organization, but I think it's not too grandiose to say in the history of the communist movement, because we inherit the genuine traditions of Bolshevism, the genuine traditions of Leninism, the Trotskyists who, in the face of Stalinist um, generation of the Russian Revolution facing attacks, not just from the capitalists, but from Stalin and his agents were beaten from pillar to post for decades. Trotsky exiled and executed. Um, many of his followers persecuted. Trotsky, of course, attempted to establish a fourth international after the degeneration of the third, in the same way that Lenin did after the degeneration of the second. For various reasons, we don't have time to go into, that was stillborn, um, or very quickly um, failed to 
rise to the occasion. But now we are ready as an organization, as Bolsheviks, as Marxists, as communists in that tradition to reclaim the banner of communism and to use it to draw in a whole new layer of revolutionary cadres, of radicalized young people, the burgeoning vanguard of the working class, the embryo of the mass international revolutionary organization that history necessitates to put an end to capitalism and create a better world. And that uh, is the purpose of founding the RCI. That's the purpose of everything we do. Um, as the international Marxist tendency, very soon to be the revolutionary communist international. If you've enjoyed this discussion or any of the discussions that we've had on this show, anything you've read, anything in our manifesto, if you're drawn to the ideas that we espouse and if you're angry about the state of capitalism, if you're incensed and indignant about the hypocrisy and the lies of the bourgeois, your ruling class, their propaganda, um, their media establishments, the crimes of the state, the crimes of imperialism, then guess what? You might just be a communist. And if you're a communist, then you need to get organized. So we're taking a little break on the podcast. I'm going to end with the most important message that I can emphasize if you are a communist, you need to join the Revolutionary Communist International. You need to sign up for our founding conference, the World School of Communism. All the links are in the description. And once the conference is over, we'll be back with a new season, a new suite of discussions on all manner of Marxist ideas. We'll be talking about history, about theory, and we'll resume the Lenin year. So the Lenin year episodes will, of course, take a break as well. We'll be back with new episodes about Lenin's life and ideas, his work. We still haven't talked about left-wing communism. We haven't talked about imperialism. Don't worry, all those episodes are coming after the Revolutionary Communist International's founding conference. But for now, that's all from me. I'll thank Fred one more time for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me again. And for the last time, for a little while, here on the Spectre of Communism podcast, solidarity, long live communism, long live the Revolutionary Communist International. I'll see you in Italy in June for our founding conference. <laughs> <laughs>